Morning, church. Good to be in the house. And uh, great sense of the presence of God this morning. Good to see you if you're, if you're visiting this morning. We are, we are always blessed um, to have guests and visitors in the house. And I know, I know afterwards we not only have tea and coffee this morning, but I know we have a, a birthday cake for the birthday boy. And so um, please, please stay this morning. We just uh, love to have a conversation with you and just get to know you this morning. Um, welcome to Father's Day service. Um, I, I, I think it was, I, I sat there this morning, I was trying to formulate what was in my spirit this morning. You know, uh, an, an honor culture is a culture where you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That is, a, that is an honor culture. An honor culture is where you have every generation and every race. Um, and, you know, it says a, a really negative thing in the Bible. It says, actually, that Jesus could do no miracles because there was no honor. And there is something about an honor culture that attracts the Spirit of the Lord. Um, because you remember when the centurion uh, came to Jesus, he recognized in Jesus that he said, I'm also one that is under authority. He recognized that Jesus was under the authority of his father. Hallelujah. And there is, a, there is a place that is really broken down in our society today where there isn't an honor of fathers, there isn't an honor of grandfathers, and there is a despising of youth. And all of those things become a, di a dishonor. But when you come into the kingdom of God, you begin to honor culture and you begin to honor the generations. And when you do that, I believe that attracts the, the spirit of the Lord this morning. And so when we were designing the service this morning as a Father's Day service, I, I, I reached out to my own father who was, just happened to be also a founding um, pastor here to say we would like you to speak in the house because that is an honor culture this morning. We I don't, I don't believe in my heart that you reach a certain age and we dispense of you. I, I, th I think you're invaluable as you get older to what you have to say in the house with your wisdom and your experience because you're able to actually reach into other generations and say, I know him too. And I know him in this way. And I can tell you for whatever you're going through, God is faithful. So I, I love the Lamentations verse this morning. For this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Can we say amen this morning? So I, I, honor, I honor everybody who is older than me this morning. I'm getting to an age in this church where there's less people that are older than me, right? But while I can still say for those who are older than me, I honor you this morning. And I, I, honor, I honor those who are that sort of 40 to um, 60 age group. And those who are a little bit younger and, and, and those who are very young and are teenagers. And I, I, I do want to say I am, I am, you know, when people are looking for a church to go to, and I, I say this all the time, I've been a long time in church, so I, I have no agenda. I have no huge salary that comes from this church. So it is, I, there is absolutely zero agenda in my heart except that God has called Zeld and me to pastor this church and, and to do something for the kingdom, right? And I think... We're not going to get through the message this morning, sure we're not. But uh, I, I, I think that our journey up until the age of 47, until at 47 we were asked to pastor a church, I, I felt I was more equipped at 32, but God had to break a whole lot of stuff in me and a whole lot of things that I didn't even know was there so I would be ready to pastor with hopefully a pure heart with absolutely no agenda to see something raised up here that can transform there. And this is because I, I'm not trying to build a place where there's numbers. I'm trying to build people. Yeah. I'm trying to build people that can come in and say, you have no idea which, do you know the good thing about us all here this morning? You all came the same way. And you all maybe have a different story. And some of you came where you thought you were really fixed up and then God had to deprogram you. And some of you came where you were absolutely bruised and broken and you came into a place where you were vulnerable 
And you come in, because when you come into the presence of God, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He takes all the vulnerability and he doesn't, dis, he, he doesn't discard you because you feel you're broken or you feel you're hurt. He actually takes all of that. He says, now I'm going to rebuild you in an authenticity in the way that you're going to be a strength to others. And that's what he does. And so the Holy Spirit allows you to hang about. Some, some of you have hung about for a long time. I'm not going to mention some names in the church, but there are some people that I met maybe and they were maybe here three or four years before they even felt they were qualified to go back into ministry. And it was okay for me to allow you to be in because the Lord allowed me to be there just to be in the presence of the Lord because the Holy Spirit knows how to take all of those tears and all of those broken things. And you know what, church? We are never meant just to stay in, in tears and broken things, but there is a season for that. There's a season where you might weep for a while, you might mourn for a while, but, but the writer in Ecclesiastes says there's a time to mourn and then there's a time to be rebuilt and there's a time to plant and there's a time to come again. And this is, what, this, is what the, this is what the Holy Spirit does. So wherever you are in the journey, you might be a stone person. Uh, you actually might be a reed person. You remember what it says about Jesus, a, 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 brook, a reed he'll not, you know, a bruised reed he'll not break. You, you, this is, so the Holy Spirit knows that you can be at different stages, you can be fragile. And what he does, he takes, he takes reed people and he makes them to be stone people. Because First Peter says we are lively stones. How alive were you this morning in the worship? Were you dead stones? Or were you alive stones? First Peter says we are alive. We are lively stones built up to be a spiritual house. You're a spiritual house and you're built up to be a spiritual house. And do you know how you bring sacrifices to the Lord? It's through praise. Otherwise, we're all bringing lambs and goats and pigeons to the house of the Lord and we're slaying animals in the house, but he was slain from the foundation of the world, one sacrifice for all. And what does he require of us this morning? That we come as lively stones, become alive in who he is this morning because he is the resurrection and you might be a reed, a stone. You might be a pillar. Because in Revelation says, him that overcomes, I will make him a pillar. And you know what pillars do? You know what pillars do in temples and churches? Do you know what a pillar person is? It's a person that holds up the foundations of the church, holds up the structures of the church to allow more people to come in. So you may come as a stone and you might say at the start, well, it's just all about me. I got saved. And and because at the start, it is all about you. But the purposes of the Holy Spirit is it's all about them. And so he builds you that they can come. And that that requires an expansion of your heart. We did say amen this morning. Welcome to Father's Day. Um, We honor all the dads. It's good that Zelda did it in the house this morning. We honor the fathers in the house. We honor, you can give them another clap and an applause this morning. There is no manual to being a dad. Correct? You, you learn to be a father by observation. And by watching others, you learn by a lot of mistakes. You learn by investing time. I, I would say... To anybody who is a father or those who wish to be a father, I tell you what your kids want more than anything else. It's not an Xbox or Donkey Kong. Who remembers Donkey Kong? <laughs> it was my first ever computer. It was Donkey Kong. If you're 30, you've no idea. You've just no idea what I said. But, but you and you, you, your kids want your time. They, 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 want, they want your time. They want your bad dad jokes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> yes. Very bad jokes. You don't become a father overnight. You, gr- you grow into being a father. I, I became a dad at 26. I, w- I don't believe I was a mature father at 26. In fact, Zelda had said to me, she felt like I was still playing marbles till I was 30. 
and yet I was this dad with this young man here at the front, and when Joel was born, I didn't even know, I, I couldn't even understand the pregnancy. I couldn't understand why she wanted me, then she didn't want me. <laughs> I couldn't understand why she was in hospital all the time, because Joel was making her sick. And so when you're 26 and you're a dad, you don't understand, but you grow into being a father. Um, it takes time to be a father. When Joel was born, is this wee small baby, and I remember getting cotton wool and just wipe it. We just, we really muddy cuddled Joel, by the way. We just, every, everything that Zelda and I were, were pumped into Joel in the first two years. <laughs> you need a lot of prayer, Joel. That's what's going on. And so you just muddy, by the time Joshua came, we just threw him into the bath. Because <laughs> we were exhausted by the time you have four. And I used to say to people, how many kids do you have? Three? Don't have four. If you have four, go for eight. Everything changes. Do you know when we had three kids, people used to invite us to their house for supper? When we had four kids, no invites. When you have four kids, your car changes. You can't have a sporty car. When you have four kids, when you go on holidays, you have to find a big house or villa or tent. <laughs> Whatever it is. I have one father like you all biologically. And we had a great time with dad last night. It was great fun. I have one father biologically. But I've had many fathers who have helped me spiritually. Yes. And I, I just want to say because I'm always conscious in a room when I talk about children that some people say I have no kids. And I'm always very conscious of that in the room. But I want to tell you this morning, everyone can be a father. In fact, everyone can be a brother. And every, everyone can have men, every man in this room can have an influence on another man. And Paul the Apostle, who didn't have any children, Paul the Apostle said, we don't need more teachers, we need more fathers. We, need, we don't need more teachers. Sometimes the biggest worry that young men have, particularly if you're, you're in your 20s or 30s, and I understand that, because I may have been of one of them, we get a little bit of knowledge, we get a little bit of revelation, and then we think we're going to take the word for Jesus, and that is not how it works in the kingdom. It's not how it works. Stewardship works better than revelation. And, and what happens, church, Paul says, I've had a lot of teachers, I have a lot of people that know a lot of information, but I want there to be more fathers in the church. And you know what fathers do? They nurture. They come alongside. They pray for you. They say, do you want me to take you out for a coffee? The pastor's busy. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Or, or I want to take a couple of the young people and I want to see how they're doing with the Lord. That, that is what is being a father, church. That is what it's being is looking out and saying, how can I help you? How can, how can I mentor you? Because some of the young men in our church may not have dads. Or they may, not have, they may have dads who are not there. Or they may have dads who don't have the skills just to look after you. And so when they come into church, what they're looking for is fathers. Yes. Yes. Amen. They're looking for fathers. And so I'm going to tell you this morning, the church needs more dads. Amen. It needs more fathers. It needs, it needs more men to take their place. I gave a stat last year at our Father's Day service. I'm going to give the stat again so you understand. Do you know they say that if a father attends church, it's, it's up to nearly 90% chance that his whole family will come with him. If, if a single mom comes to church, it's something like 35%. So I salute the single moms. I, see, the moms that come to church, you're the 35 percenter. Like, we take our hat off to you, and we applaud you in the house this morning. But there is something about men taking their place. There's something, and it's in the, in the woke society that we live in, <laughs> or the wrong view of what a man's role is in the church and in the house, not that dogmatic, authoritarian-type role. That's not Bible role, Right? 
But when a man takes his place, what do women want a man to do? They want him to lead. I can tell you if I'm out with Zelda, <laughs> and it's a Friday night, and on Friday night we do family night, and you see if I don't have thought through, it is the most frustrating night if I haven't thought through what we're going to eat. It is my responsibility to think, to lead in the food. And what, what families are looking is for men to take their place. They're looking for fathers to be spiritual, to be men of prayer, to be men who are vulnerable, to be men who love. They're looking for fathers to take their place and say, let's go to the house of the Lord. Because yes. 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 your kids will copy what they see. Yes. You see, if they see your dad in, in, in a living room or in a bedroom on his knees praying, guess what your kids are going to do? And by the way, ladies, you take 95% of your DNA from your father. And you want to be what your dad is. And most women will marry somebody who is like their dad. Zelda. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's okay to laugh in church. So it's okay to say that's right because I'm a lot like my dad. Amen. <laughs> and that's a good thing, Sister Margaret. Amen. Yes. <laughs> so we don't need more teachers. We need more fathers, more mentors, more pillars. We don't need. I'm going to show you something that makes me vulnerable because I'm actually deep down a private person. I'm only ever going to show you this once. And you're never going to see it again. Don't put it up yet. Matthew. Matthew's Boston King to put this up. For the service pastor, Matthew was going to guess to me on the computer screen. But a lot of years ago, the church done something weird where we all had to come in a fancy dress and dress up in the minor. I don't even know. I don't know whose idea it was. All I can tell you was I wasn't the pastor. And we had to dress up. So if it was wrong and it was weird, it wasn't me. And we had to dress up. And I had the church bus, and I was collecting a few people, and I had decided to dress up in a certain outfit, <clears throat> and it was dark, and guess what? It was raining, and it was around about November, and a small car drove up beside the church bus, and I, there was four elderly women in, in it, in the car, <clears throat> and the four elderly women rolled down the window, and you know where the, you know the older generation used to go, yoo-hoo, <laughs> you don't remember, <laughs> young man, young man. <laughs> Well, they rolled down the window and they, uh, they, they sort of nodded and I forgot I was dressed. I want to show you how I was dressed. This is exactly how I was dressed. <laughs> it must have been a long time ago because I couldn't grow a beard. So that's what's been a long. So I was dressed as Superman. And I was sitting in the church bus, and they knocked, and I forgot it, and I jumped out with the cape. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? And they, I, think they were, I think they were shocked. And I said, we're lost, and then I give them directions. And I could just see them, they, as they put up the window and left, I could just see them laughing. And I could see them saying, we were rescued tonight by a red cape superhero. We can take the picture down, Matthew. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because the church doesn't need more red cape superheroes. In fact, I'm going to say something else. We don't, we don't need mighty men of God in the pulpit. None of the Puritans, none of the reformers talk that way. They don't use the term mighty men of God. They use the term men who've been made mighty, weak men, vulnerable men who've been made mighty by the God they've come to trust. That's what we need in the church. Yes. And that, that was the heroes of the Bible. That was David's 37. By the way, David had 37 mighty men. That was David's mighty men. That he had men who find God as a good father and encountered him. And when they encountered God with all of their weaknesses, because every man, every man and most of the women who ever encountered God had flaws they had weaknesses, counted from Genesis right through. They're not a man alive that didn't have a flaw and a weakness. 
But when they find God, God took their weakness. And it's, you know what? Because the Bible says his strength is made perfect where? In our weaknesses. And he took these men who find God to slew giants, subdue kingdoms, stop lions' mice, and they brought many generations into the blessings of the Lord. So I just want to say this morning, if you're a dad, you're doing a great job. Give a big amen in the church. And if you're not sure what to do, God will help you. You're a blessing. You are a stability. And you are a security to your family. And I just bless you this morning. I bless all the dads, all the men in the house in Jesus' name. Give every man in the hall. I do have a series that I had announced, and, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and I had, I had a series, uh, and I am going to do it, by the way. I'm just going to do it in, in, I think, sometime in August. But I have, a, I have a word on my heart, and I hope it's prophetic, but I have, I have a word for the four generations in the church. So if you are a young person, I have a word for you. If you are in your 30s, there is a very specific word that God has for somebody who's in their 30s. If you're between 40 and 60, there is a word for you. If, you're, if you are 60 and over, there's a word. But I, I felt with all that was going on in my own life, I felt with holiday time, I, I, I want to I wanna lay it with the church where I'm settled and the church is settled so that we can lay that in before we come back into September. So pray, pray, pray into it. So I'm, I'm not, not going to do a church. And so forgive me this morning. That shows you how vulnerable I am. Um, but forgive me because I just wrestled through it all week. And I just want to lift it. And I just, I just want to set it at a different season in the church. We need to say amen this morning. So where am I going this morning? Well, I'm going back to the garden. And if you haven't been in our teaching uh, for the last sort of 10 weeks, um, at least three times, and twice with myself, I think once with Clements, maybe, maybe slightly more, but everybody has went or at least touched a little bit on the garden. And so I have unfinished business in the garden. And so I'm going to go back to the garden. I'm going to go back to what I feel the Holy Spirit wants to sort of eke out that, that, I, that I believe will be very helpful to us this morning. And so I, I tortured Elsa a little bit this morning. I, went, I wasn't 100% sure of my title, so I put up two titles. And what you can do at the end, you can decide which one's for you. That's probably the best. So we're going to uh, return to the tree of right and wrong or naked and not ashamed. <laughs> Whatever one's for you. Amen. This morning, I want to return to the tree of right and wrong or, or the belief system that is default in, in most human beings. It's definitely default in most churches. doesn't matter if you're spirit-filled, not spirit-filled. In fact, sometimes I find the spirit-filled churches have defaulted more to a tradition than the evangelical churches. And so I, I want to return um, to the tree of right and wrong or the belief system that we all have around good and evil. Because we all, we all have, we all measure each other and we measure our lives and we measure churches. Trust me, we measure churches by good and evil or, or by right and wrong. What is right for our church, we don't think maybe is right for another church. This is how we think. Um, um, for example, Zelda and I, in fact, I'll not go there, but I will go there. Zelda and I went to a church once and they said, just when you come, they said to me, make sure you wear a shirt and tie and make sure your wife has a hat. Because they were, they, were, they were deeming what we would be by the culture of that house. And I even said to Zelda, do you have a hat? I think Zelda might have said to me, I have a sombrero. Does, does, that, does that help? So I, I'm just trying to tell you, um, and we could go through a whole list here, by the way. We could go through a whole list of dress codes, worship styles, um, Lots of different things that you do that you deem as right and wrong, but it's actually just a cultural thing or it's actually a root thing that actually comes from the garden. So I want to talk a little about that, and I do that because it is, it is a foundational thinking that is so much in the church. And I want to say it at the start, yet it is not the voice of the Lord. Because the issue is not what is right and wrong. The issue is what is death and life. Amen, church. 
And we have a lot of a thought process in the church to flourish around the fact that we are designed to know right and wrong. But I'm going to show you in a minute that's not Bible. And that flows this morning from a wrong tree thinking that actually is designed to bring death to the church. And what happens when you go around the wrong tree, you become devoted to the wrong thing that doesn't bring you life. When Adam and Eve partook of the, and I want to give you the freest so you all know it, Adam and Eve partook of the tree of good and evil. I think for some reason we think it was the tree of evil, but the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that they partook of the tree of good and evil. They took of the tree of the knowledge of right and wrong. And what they thought would increase them. See, they thought if they knew more good than evil. They thought if they, if they knew more right and wrong, that, would, uh, that it would empower them to live better and to know better. But actually, we all know in the hall this morning, by eating of the tree, it actually brought them death. And I said it a few weeks ago, you were not designed to know good. You were designed to know God. You were designed to know God. You may, you may have a good choice, but it may not be a God choice. I can tell you, in mo most times when you counsel people, People will tell you they have a word from the Lord and they're going to do this and it feels good to them. And it actually, it actually moves them away from the house of the Lord or it detaches them from family or God told me not to be married to that person. And all of these things go on and they believe it's good in their own mind. But I want to tell you, it's not God. So good choices may not be God choices. Amen. And it's quite amazing to me that the place of good in the garden as much as the place of evil brought equal death. And so the result of eating from the tree of good and evil, listen to what I'm saying, the, the result of eating of the tree of good and evil exposed our first parents to how vulnerable we all are outside the voice and the presence of God. So it's, a, it's a vulnerability, church. Why did, why did they hide? Why did our first parents hide? Well, they said we hid because we heard your voice. But before they partook of the tree, they knew his voice every day. Something, something had shifted where they would walk with God. They would know his voice. And by the way, his voice is his presence. Right? When, when he says, when Moses said, my presence, if your presence doesn't go with you, it's not something mystical. Because sometimes in Pentecostal churches, we, we mysticize things, right? It's not something that's mystical. His presence is his voice. Anytime you ever see something that looks mystical in the Bible, and I'm, I've started, I've just finished Jeremiah, and now I'm on, and I'm on Ezekiel, and I've started with the wheel that's within the wheels, right? But you're going to hear a voice. Or if you come to a burning bush and it looks really strange, you're going to hear a voice. So whatever you think is mystical, some people want to be really mystical about things. Some people want to say, I saw seven rainbows and four horses and seven things and three buses and I need to marry Jeannie, right? It's mystic, mystical. God, God, whatever you see that looks like a wonderful thing will be God speaking, clarity. Because God is not confused. And you shouldn't be confused this morning. His voice is clear. What does he not say? My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And so they, they had this voice and they walked with God and they were not ashamed and it was good. They out of the tree of right and wrong, now they hear his voice and they hide. What had changed between being comfortable and not afraid Naked and not afraid. 
And I, I said a few weeks ago, don't, don't get hung up on that word. Because we are carnal, we see that word naked and suddenly we focus on the idea of nakedness. They were not aware of their nakedness because they were clothed with the voice and the glory of God. Their consciousness was at a different level. But once they partook of the tree of knowledge and good of evil, they now became self-aware. And the first thing that came when they became self-aware was fear. Because when he said, when God came, and I would say God's heart was broke. Because when God came into the garden, same place, I, I, I'm going to tell you how good your father is. He, he would have been so excited to say to the angels, I'm meeting Adam and Eve tonight. You think, I don't, you think God wasn't like that? Just look at the prodigal son in the New Testament, how he run for the boy. I can tell you, see, we have a, we have a warped view of God. We have a compli complicated view of God. Can't seem to get through a lot of fogginess. I just want to tell you, your heavenly Father is good, and he delights to be with you this morning. And God is in the garden. God already knows what's happened. See, God already knew the whole journey because it says that Christ was slain in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Now, I can't work that out. I just trust God. But I know he was slain in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. I know that the heart of that is love for me before the first day I ever sinned. And so he's in the garden and he's looking for him. And what does Adam say? Adam's a big fella now because he's speaking up even though Eve, see Adam, Eve was deceived. Adam willfully sinned. But he speaks up and he says, we heard the sound of your voice. Wow. And we were afraid because we were naked. Yet I was with your voice before and I was naked and I was not afraid. So what had changed? What had changed was this code or this root system in this tree of right and wrong and not presence. And when you have a code of right and wrong and your default of how you see God or how you try to perform to get to God, what happens when you don't reach the code is you fear. And so the first response is fear. What is the, after the first response of fear, what does God do up until Christ? Every time God appears, every time an angel appears, what's the first two words he says? Fear not. Because he's trying to deal with the psychology of the tree. So what he says, I don't want you to fear. I'm not going to, you don't need to hide from me. I don't want you to fear. I want to be your God. I am pursuing you. Don't fear. So the result of sin is you fear. And the second result of sin Sin is you have shame. We were afraid because we are sad church. They were naked. They were, they, were, they were afraid that God would see them for what they really were. They, they, were, they were afraid that God would know their thoughts and God would know the deep recesses of their heart. And they said, we, we've heard your, we don't, your presence. I'm, this is what we do in church. Your presence I can only go so far into your presence because I'm afraid God will know everything about me. I fear he will know all of the things that I think and all of the things that I feel with, yet God is not put off by your vulnerability. In fact, God, God seeks out vulnerable people. God seeks out messed up people. God actually runs. And so when you come into your presence, you don't have to say that, that you know, if you're a believer and you have sinned, the old school was that you don't partake of the table. When you understand the magnitude of the table, you run to the table. It's actually the place of life. It's actually the place where you're reminded as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. You come to the table. What, what do you do? What, is, what does he say when you sin? Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we might have help in the time of need, in the time of trouble. When do you need the table more than anything else? When do you need the presence? When you've messed up? Amen. It's a really good point. If I was there, I'd have done that. No, too late. Is, is that making sense? So they, they hide. 
Because they're not self-aware and not God-aware. When you are self-aware, you will fear. When you're conscious of what you're not, you will fear. But when you're conscious of who you are in God, you will not fear because perfect love casts out all fear. And there is a healthy fear of God, which actually most of the time is translated as worship. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Perfect love casts out a fear. There is a healthy fear. We, we talked about that a few weeks ago. But there's a fear of man, fear that people will know me that actually brings you to a stir. I heard the sound of your voice. I'm conscious of myself. And I'm afraid because I'm vulnerable before you. Amen. First response to sin is fear. The second response is shame. The issue is that the presence of God or the voice, the voice of God, if that's easier for you to understand, is no longer my dom. I'm, I'm no longer feeding from the life giver. Does that make sense to you? So when, when you worry, how many have never worried? How many are worrying right now? <laughs> right? Worry removes you from what God has said. Okay? You, you have a sickness, you worry, or you get the scriptures out, and you say, I'm the Lord thy God that heals me. Or you, or, you get this, or you have a financial problem and you say, I don't know where I'm going to get the job. And then you go in and you realize that he is Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. And he said, I'll provide everything for me. I just want you to abide. I don't want you to work this up. I want you to abide. And so when you have worry, what you, or, or you have worry, or you have all of these negative connotations, what begins to happen? You become self-aware and self-focused. And, and, and then you might even become self-deprecating. Do you know how many times Jesus was self-deprecating in his three and a half years ministry? You know many, many times he said, oh, darn, I'm not good, or I didn't do that right? Zero. You are a child and a daughter, son and the daughter of God, and you should walk onto the same place because your heavenly Father is pleased with you. Amen. He has cleansed your sin. He's given you the Holy Spirit, and you're walking under a favorite place with the Lord. And what you should be speaking out of your mouth is says, God's going to do this. God is going to change that circumstance. God is going to heal me. God is going to bless our church. God is going to bless my neighbor, that neighbor that's been tormenting me. I don't know how to deal with them. But I'm, I'm just going to pray for wisdom. And then God says, I give you the wisdom, buy them a box of chocolates. <laughs> Blow their mind. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say this morning, church, is when you leave God's voice, you become self-aware, yeah. self-deprecating, fearful, shame. And then you default to a tree and you begin to climb the ladder again when you're ready to see if I can get all these codes done, more good than evil. If I can get more good in my life than evil, God will approve of me. And that is wrong tree thinking. And it's a religion. And it's, it's a religion around good and evil. But we're Pentecostal. We don't have. Like we're at the top of the Reformation chain. <laughs> <laughs> That's how people think, by the way. We, you don't speak in tongues? Wow. <clears throat> See, the beauty of, of presence and intimacy and voice and vulnerability that's why Jesus said, I want you to be like childlike. Is lost in a life where pursuing right and wrong, good and evil, instead of God, voice, and presence. When you have intimacy, devotion, abiding in your Father's love, you don't fear. Now, I would say to everybody in the hall this morning, if you are afraid of something, get back into the presence of God. Amen. How do you know it's religion? 
How do you know when you walk into a gathering or a church gathering and it's religion? I'll tell you why. When you mess up, you fear. Because you're afraid to tell your brother and sister. You're definitely afraid to tell your pastor. And that's a culture of fear. That's not a culture like Peter where the goodness of the Lord. What does God do with Peter? When, when we know Peter, what does God do with Peter when he messes up? Puts him at the back of the church. Tells him he needs to go on a repentance program for eight months. And when he's fully ready, he can go before the Sanhedrin, sorry, the pastor board. And then when we deem him fit because he's done more good than evil, we'll restore him. No, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus went to Peter, who, who royally messed up. Peter was the guy that would answer questions, and Jesus hadn't even asked a question. What did Jesus do? Jesus blessed his business abundantly, even while he was in that state of denial. And what did Peter do? He fell to his knees and said, your goodness has overwhelmed for me. I, I, I'm such an evil man. Depart from me. God didn't do it, of course. But he was still at that self-deprecating place. And God was actually lavishing his blessing upon him. Because the goodness of the Lord leads us to change our mind about how we think about ourselves. Because that's what repentance means. And how we think about God. Is that okay? You default to a, and I talked about it a few weeks ago, a fig leaf Christianity that encourages more good than evil instead of more God and encounter. So I'm, I'm never, I'm never going to let you leave this church with a bunch of rules but I'm going to let you leave the church every time you come with more encounter with Jesus. Your good choices may not be God choices. Yeah. Right? How many have ever made a good choice and you realize afterwards, that wasn't God. And it may feel good, but it may not be God. And why we still default to good and evil and right and wrong, we never fully get dressed. You see what I've done? Typology. We never fully get dressed in the right clothes. What are the right clothes? The glory of God. His voice. And we default to what Burley covers us. You know what Burley covers us? More good than evil. And when you're Burley covered, you know what we do in the church? Because we don't want to be vulnerable, we hide behind bushes. And some of those bushes are doctrine. Some of those bushes are church tradition. Fig league thinking is a, is a real problem in the systems of the church. Fig leaf is a problem in the church. And it's amazing to me that they were more ashamed when they were clothed with the fig leaf than when they were naked. Because when they were naked and vulnerable and real and authentic and honest before God, there was no shame. When they covered themselves to hide, they were afraid. They were ashamed. The actual fruitfulness of thriving in life is lost in the default of making choices. Listen, I'm going to say, making choices out of principles or knowledge or codes or rules, even discipleship. The only reason we disciple you is to disciple you so you will know more authentic his voice and his presence. To me, discipleship isn't just about, you know, in the early church fathers and knowing how structures work and teams work and all of those things can be good to allow things to function. But if discipleship doesn't lead you to him and for you to have a more, uh, an exposure of who God is, then you've missed the whole point of discipleship. And you live a whole life on rules and debates. When I was my younger days, I would have debated with you over a few doctrines. 
But I said to you a few weeks ago, I lost a few friends. Today, I'd rather keep silent even if I disagree with you and win you as a friend and a brother. I'd rather keep you as a friend because it takes a long time to have friends. You can lose them like that. You know what the Bible says? If you want to have friends, show yourself friendly. If you want to have a wife, mingle. <laughs> if you don't mingle, you'll always be single. It's not in the Bible, by the way. It's not in, it's not a, that is not a Bible quote. It's maybe the message in the Genesis. I don't know. It says that Adam was alone, right? <laughs> We make more of dis dis disciple principles, information than the vulnerability of being in the presence of God. And I, I can tell you, I want you to listen to me, I can tell you that most churches fear, most, most believers that I meet will fear a presence-led church because they think there's no structure. Than a principle right and wrong church. That's why we sign up to some other churches because we want to be in churches that know what's right and wrong. Can call it out for culture. <laughs> we want to be part of a church that keeps the rules. The problem is nobody's keeping the rules. And when you have that culture of fear where everybody has to keep the rules, you know what they do? They hide sin under the, under the carpet. They have everybody hiding behind the bushes on a Sunday. And actually, the Holy Spirit takes you out of all of that and builds you much better. We don't have to keep all the rules. You just follow the voice. <laughs> That's why in the Old Testament typology, it said when the cloud moved, they moved. <laughs> keep to the rules. And in some ways, I want you to listen to me. We think, we think we are more true with principles and presence. Because it can be qualified. It looks better. Actually, principles looks more like the church. Actually, actually, I want to tell you this morning, some people think you don't look like the church. Far aside. You, you, don't, you don't behave like the church sometimes. To say you're a reflection of the person you sit under. But this is... This is <laughs> This is how people think. And if you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me on tradition and doctrine and all of those things, I know every song, by the way. I know all the new ones, all the old ones. We had that in the house last night. We were singing fantastic old songs. I knew them all. But I know all the new ones too. It's not about any of that stuff, church. Not about any of it. It's not about any of it at all. Do you think that David's mighty man, when they first arrived, looked like the church? I can tell you if you read anything about when David began to gather, David didn't want a church. In fact, David was trying to work. Do you know what people say to you? I have my own issues. <laughs> I don't want to look. That's only the pastor says. I have my own issues. I don't want them ringing me. I don't have my own issues, right? Well, when David's mighty man appeared, the first time to appear, it says that everybody that was distressed, everybody was broke, everybody was mentally unstable, they gathered themselves on the David. <laughs> and they were the church. They became the mighty man of valor. <laughs> you don't look like the church. <laughs> You're not as respectable, doesn't look like. I've had loads of people say that to me, and I just chuckle. Because we are more comfortable with fig leaves than nakedness. And the only reason we don't take off the fig leaf is we're afraid to expose ourselves to God who knows everything about you and who's actually looking to have intimacy with you. Because he says, before, before you were even born, I knew you. And I knew the tapestry. I knew, every, I knew every thread, every cell, every joint that was coming together. I knew you in your womb, says the Lord. And yet we hide from the God who knows us. 
and we, we cover ourselves in religion, even in the spirit-filled churches, and we call it God. And I tell you what it is, it's the wrong tree. We are so afraid of leaving principles. We're so afraid of getting our church code wrong. Yet God is saying, if you come to me, I'll not only give you life, I'll give you fruitfulness, and I'll show you how to walk through this. There, there is a verse, and I don't think I've read a scripture, so just in case you think, I went to that church. They never read a scripture. You want to read a scripture so you know that we are definitely a church. <laughs> it's great that you don't give me a full-time salary because uh, you can't sack me. It's just really good. I think if you give me a full-time salary, I think I would feel confined and, and I, I would be a bit like Leah to see and I'd have to give you what you want <laughs> rather than what God wants, amen. So at this point, you're getting what God wants, right? There is a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 that we have defaulted to. And it troubled Paul. And you, and you see if Paul, it troubled Paul, you should prick up your ears a little bit. Because Paul was the architect. You, you wouldn't have most of the New Testament. You would have it with Peter and John. I, get, I grant that in James. But the, but the hardcore stuff is from Paul. And, and Paul, Paul labored in the churches. He, you know, we could do a whole study on Paul. Some people think Paul was small. Some, some people think he had poor eyesight. And Paul was in prison. Paul got stoned. Paul got bit by a viper. I mean, you want to be full time for Jesus. <laughs> That's what it was for Paul. No snowflake generation. That, that, was, that was real man, real authenticity. And Paul said, I've labored. I'm actually, Paul used to go to your church. If you invited Paul to your church for a weekend, he stayed for two years. <laughs> And he get into your, and you would be said, I'd be ringing you and saying, um, uh, Brother Clemens, Paul wants to visit you on Monday night for dinner. Are you free? No, we've got, we're doing classes. No, he says he's, he'll, he'll wait till the classes. He'll be there at 8.30 when you're finished and you're exhausted. <laughs> he actually wants to come. That's exactly how Paul was. Paul got in under your skin. And Paul got in because he said, I'm trying to labor. What he was trying to form, he was trying to form dented and he was trying to form who God was. And actually, you know what Paul said? I actually come from all of the root, the root systems of the tree. I actually come, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, circumcised on the eighth day. I knew the oral law. I knew the law of my forefathers. I could run it in. He says, and I'm going to take all of that tree and all of that learning and I cut it all but down because I want Christ to be formed in you. And he deprogrammed all of the religion. Know how unreligious they got? By the end of Acts, he didn't even have a church, temple, building. It's a lovely church building. Paul wouldn't have known anything about it at the end of Acts. It's just a means to an end. We used to be in a community center. We now have a beautiful building. I don't know where we'll end up. It's important just that you gather and then you scatter, right? Dad used to say when he was younger in one of the churches he went to, they didn't really have anything, but they had three buckets in the middle of the church and the, it leaked. But they were the gathering of the, they were the church. And the presence of God was as much there as it is here. So there's a verse that said, and Paul, 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 Paul was actually so troubled that he actually feared something. And Paul said, I, I, I'm going to say something to you. I'm fearing something about you. And what he does, he, he's about to jump back to Eden. He, he, he actually was addressing the first church, wow, first church to talk to him about Eden. There's something there's something that happened in Eden I don't want in your church. Is everybody still following me? And he says, I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion. Everybody say devotion. devotion. Everybody say devotion. devotion. To Christ will be corrupted. What does he say? Just as Eve. Just as Eve. 
just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent, the ESV says, you'll be led astray from your pure devotion to, to Christ. The King James says corrupted. And I love this from the simplicity because your life had to be simple. God never wanted your life to be complex and complicated. Church does that. Tradition does that. You do that. We, we have so much complexity in our churches. <clears throat> and I was going to say in Northern Ireland, no, I can go to any culture in the world, any church in the world, and they will all have complexities to do with God. The simplicity, here's the simplicity. Can I summarize it? The simplicity is this, God loving us and making his home with us was all it was ever meant to be. And in the pursuit of right and wrong and codes and rules and traditions and doctrines and laws and holiness and debates and all of those things, we have complicated God and removed the hearer from the simple devotion to Christ. Simple devotion. And our thinking, listen, I'm going to say, our thinking is the enemy of intimacy. Because I don't care how much you know, how much doctrine you know, how many Bible schools you've been, how many PhDs, and they're all, they're all good in its own. But when you close the door and you sit in your room and you close your eyes and you take away all your phones, you will know who you are before God. And you will know whether this is a facade or whether the authentic you is emerging because you're in the presence of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And knowledge has been the deceiver of, of devotion. Now, I've done a word study. Paul said, I fear that you would leave devotion. I fear that you will leave devotion. I fear that you will leave devotion. And I've done a word study on devotion because I knew you would want to hear it. I said to myself this week, they'll want to hear this. <laughs> Stella always wants to hear it. Well, actually, the word comes from the word to vote. Devotion, vote. And it means to affirm. It also means the, the state of, to be devoted to is, it's the state of something. So, for example, on the 4th of July, you're going to be devoted to your favorite politician. That's what it means. So when you're voting, when you go into the booth, and when you go into the cradle of democracy, and you go into your booth, and it's a private ballot, just remember you're devoting yourself to your favorite politician. I hope that doesn't keep you away. <laughs> but it means, it means to vote. Strong's concordance, English concordance, it's quite a big word there. I'm not going to attempt to say it for you in case I say it wrong. But it means to devote is to actually, actually the root word is to worship. Worship. In fact, in fact the second part of it, S-H-I-P, is where you get that, that word, the state of. I'm in the state of worship, right? Uh, let, let me give you the scripture. And it's, we're going to go somewhere with this. Acts 17, 23, Amplified. Paul said I, in Athens, I observed your objects of worship, Right? You go into the King James, he says, I beheld your devotions. And so the translators, the translators take the word devotion and the word worship and they interchange them, worship and devotion, right? What is, what is worship? It's, remember, remember the word is, devotion is to affirm, right? Worship, the state of worth. So when we say to you, let's worship the Lord our God, we're coming in to one who is worth or who is in the state of our worth and our worship. That's why I tell you all the, all the time it's not so much in the song, it's in the person. Right? Because is he worthy of our praise? Is Jesus in the state of worth? So we have worship. Right? We also have another word. Here's another word. Lord. Say it. Ship. Lordship, you thought I was going to trick you there. Lordship is the state of being Lord. Discipleship is the state of being a disciple. Fellowship. 
favorite preacher of mine used to say something. Unfortunately, he was wrong. He used to say, what is fellowship? It's fellows in a ship. It's not. Because all you're ever thinking about in the service is the boat. <laughs> it's not fellows in the ship. It's, it's the state that we are in fellowship one with another. Your devotion, listen, I'm going to say, your devotion is the state of being. Okay? Paul said, I fear you will leave the state of devotion. I'm going to say another word that you already have. And you will leave the state of being for a wrong focus. You, you will leave what you already have. This is why he was contesting. You will leave what you already have from the tree of life. Who is the tree of life? Jesus. You will leave what you already have for the wrong tree. And you will get into programs of law and discipleship and all of those things to try and bring you back to what you already have. And he says, I, I fear you're going to have the wrong focus. I fear you're going to succeed at the wrong thing. I don't want you to have it. I don't want you to have a tree that questions who God is, questions what his word says, and then gives you codes to try and get back to God. And the codes are right and wrong. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm nearly there, so don't, I, if you can just, everybody just give me about three minutes. I'm going to cut my sermon in half. <laughs> what happens at the other tree? First thing is, hath God said. When you, when you default into fear, you begin to say, I'm not sure about God's word to me. When you default into fear, you begin to say, I don't know if God is really this good. Am I, am I, everybody talk to me. Let's be normal. Hath God really said it? And the result of a loss of devotion is unbelief. And what happens? You now feel, it's not the truth, but you now feel distant from God. You now feel you've let God down. It's amazing the amount of people who question God's goodness when they are sick. And, and the mindset from the second tree is to say that God makes you sick to teach you a lesson. Or God is punishing me because I've done something wrong. Yet it violates the word that says all of the wrath of God was placed on Christ. It's a complete violation of the word of God. And the deep-rooted lie, because it's a lie, church. The deep-rooted lie from this attributes evil to a God who is good. It's, 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 it's amazing that the God who says, I am the God that healed you, some people will say, God has made me sick. Amen. And it's a lie, church. And when you go to that tree or that code, when you don't reach the codes and the church rules, and, and you feel there, you begin to say, now God is punishing me until I can get back to the rules. I heard a story of a lady this week who couldn't conceive children, and she actually miscarried several children, and she rang her friend, and she said, I am convinced she was an older lady. I'm convinced that God is punishing me for how I lived in university. And that's why God is not allowing me to birth children. I just want to say to you in the hall or online, it's completely not God. And if you have that on you, I want to lift it off in Jesus' name. This, this, is, a, this is a root of the wrong tree. And it's a foundation that says God is not that good and his word isn't really what it says. And you see, when Adam and Eve out of the tree, this is, I'm, I'm honestly, just, but just bear with me. When Adam and Eve out of the tree, they had everything. Their devotion of their state of being with God already had acceptance. 
They already had fruitfulness. They already had presence. They already had success. And when you move outside of devotion or God's voice, you fear what you already have. And as a believer, I want to tell you, you already have everything in Christ. Because everything that Satan twists your mind with or tries to deceive you, I can tell you, you already have as a believer in Jesus. If you feel failure or rejection, you will devote yourself to being accepted. And some people in life do that in a perverse way. They look to be accepted, yet Ephesians says to the believer, you're already accepted in the beloved. If, if, you, if you worship or you try to devote yourself to success because you're afraid of failure, you pursue fame, you pursue influence, you look to be noticed, yet is it a devotion to the wrong thing because as you're abiding in God, God says, you abide in me, I'm going to bring prosperity and fruitfulness anyway, and what you are in secret, it'll be me that promotes you in the public. But I won't do it until you have the strength to stand in public that it won't steal your heart from me. So goodness of God follows. Everything Satan tempts you with, you all have. Don't worship. I think we have it on the screen. Don't worship or give devotion to something you already have. And don't fear something Christ has already provided. Amen. Devotion of Eve was to look for something she already have. Can I just say something to you in the church this morning? In fact, why don't you stand so you know I'm finishing. This is... When you teach the church, when you don't teach the church, she has everything she needs in Christ. She walks as a lesser version of a son and daughter. When you teach the church, she's already blessed, already favored, already complete, that I in Christ am already pleased, forgiven. When you teach the church you're already holy and righteous and perfect, then you don't have the grappling for the wrong tree. You have people who walk in abiding presence and son and daughters. Amen. Jesus really isn't happy about fig tree believing. And tell you how unhappy he's about it. In Mark 11, he cursed it. And when he cursed it, he then went into the temple two verses later to actually cleanse the root that was in the temple and overturned it. And then he said the axe is now led to the root. What root was he talking about? He's talking about the second tree. And here's what God says this morning. There's already a tree of life. And it's the Lamb, Revelation 22. And it's Jesus Christ right in the midst of the people. And he says everything you need, all the fruitfulness you need, all the healing that you need, all of my presence that you need, I will never turn away. You will never need to gain the hide. You are my son and your daughter. And all I want you to do is to be with me and devote yourself to my presence and to me. Amen. Amen. And that's not weird, church. That's not, I pray and the more I find a place in my, I, before I start today, I find a place in a room, sometimes Zelda couldn't find me last week. I was trying to hide from Zelda, actually. <laughs> trying to find Jesus and hide from Zelda. But, I, 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 uh, but it's lovely that a wife comes to look for you. But I, I'm, I, I find that place is good. But when I go about my business, I don't have time to sit. So I talk to God all day long in the car. But I, I get that place and I come in and I know I say, Father, I have everything that I've ever needed. And in all my fractures, I bring them before you that the Holy Spirit can rebuild me to be all that I'm not meant to be. I am not a feed. I am a success. I am a fruitful person in him. And I just want to tell you this morning, stop measuring yourself by the wrong tree. Measure, measure yourself by the right tree. Amen. By the right tree. And he is the tree of life in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord bless you this morning, church. And the Lord increase thee. The Lord make his face bountiful and glorious toward you. May, may our Father lift up his goodness and his mercy. May you know the Father's love who pursues you and loves you with an everlasting love. Lord, let the church go out in blessing and in favor. Open this week unto this church 
miracles and signs, doors of opportunity that seem so closed. Open them in Jesus' name. Favor your people in Jesus' precious name. Amen.